Hi, my name is Heather Brown Harding. I'm an imaging scientist at the Harvard Center for Biological Imaging. Today's topic is expansion microscopy. We're going to go over the theory and some of the pitfalls that you may encounter. The first thing to understand why we'd use expansion microscopy is the resolution of light. Resolution of light is dependent on the wavelength of the light used. So in this example, we're going to use what we, uh, approximately 500 nanometers, which would be the emission of a GFP-like fluorophore. So if we put that in with, uh, for our R is, uh, wavelength of light divided by two times the numerical aperture, we'll use a 1.4 numerical aperture objective, so that would be an oil objective. This would give us an axial resolution of approximately 1.79 nanometers. And in our lateral direction, which is always going to be more poor, we would have about 510 nanometers resolution. And to understand how this works a little better, you can see that we have a series of six lines very close together that's harder to resolve separate lines, but if we can physically move those apart in some manner, we can see the difference. So as you probably are familiar with things like CSI, we can't just go in and zoom, press and hands, and suddenly get a clear image off the reflection of someone's glasses that you were unable to see before. What you can do is increase the sample size. This is a, an example of a dinosaur that you would put in water and it grows larger. This is a common kid's toy. These are examples of a wide variety of expansion techniques. So let's go over what is the general principles of expansion microscopy. This is from the first paper of pro-expansion microscopy for protein retention. So you're going to stain, then you're going to use the acrylyl X to link the sample to the gel, going to digest out the proteins. And at that point, you can expand the sample approximately four times. And what does this do for resolution? We're effectively moving those lines apart. So in C and D, you can look at a bundle of microtubules before expansion, and then those same microtubules after expansion. If you look at E, you can see the intensity plot with the blue being pre-expansion. You can't definitively say how many microtubules are there, but after expansion in the red, you can see that there's four distinct peaks. So this creates an isotropic expansion. A variety of studies have been do done to show any changes that we might see. And if you look at E in this figure, the RMS error is just a fraction of the length. So generally, this is going to be under 1% change that you will find from the original sample. This is a table from 2001, so there's likely a lot more methods, but here's a variety of expansion microscopy, which gives you details as well as the expansion factor. I'd highly suggest checking out this review for more information. Here is a more limited selection of them. One of the things you wanna look at for your sample is, are you going to be using fluorescent proteins do these need to be preserved in some way? Or are you doing fluorescent staining? And furthermore, are you looking for proteins, DNA, saccharides, RNA? So knowing how you're gonna label and what you wanna label is key in deciding which expansion microscopy protocol will be best for you. So as I went over earlier, these are the different steps. So first we create linkers in which we 
use amine groups to link into the polymer. And there are a variety of methods to do this. And you can see in the acryl X on the bottom, it will link the protein directly to the gel so that when the digestion occurs, it will move uniformly with the gel. So what does this actually look like? Here is a video of me preparing a gel to come off the cover slip to go into digestion. I have a spacer that's one millimeter thick and there are eight different wells there. Each one is nine millimeter diameter. So I know exactly the size of what the gel is. Right now I'm peeling off the parafilm to be able to more easily take the sample off. This still has the cover slip attached to it. And this is a 12 millimeter cover slip. And because of that cover slip, it's fairly robust at this point. And I am grabbing a six well dish to be able to put this in. And I can put the sample in there. We'll add digestion buffer into that well. And then not shown is adding the fresh protonase K to do the actual digestion. So then moving from digestion to expansion, this has fully digested the sample. I'm taking a very gentle paintbrush that you would use for sectioning samples, and I'm just pushing it out of the well into a larger dish. And from there, I can now add distilled water to be able to do the expansion. And you can see that the gel has expanded somewhat during the digestion process, and this is entirely normal. So what does it actually look like? So we had our initial diameter of nine millimeters. We do the digestion and repeated distilled water washes. And here have a final gel diameter of 42 millimeters. So using these rough numbers, we can say that there's a 4.67 fold increase in the sample. So you'd have an effective resolution of 38 nanometers in the XY and 109 nanometers in the Z. This is all theoretically with a perfect sample, plenty of signal. But Unfortunately, that's not always the case, but we'll come back to that. So how do you actually measure the expansion factor? One of the more easy way to do this is go through a, your sample and pick a structure that is generally going to be the same size. So in this example, they measured the diameter of a variety of nuclei in unexpanded and a whole nother set in the expanded. We're able to show that their expansion of the microtubule network um, increased to approximately 4.68 times the original size. If you're using tissue or something that's easy to navigate, you can just image the sample before expansion and then after. So this is from the review from earlier. We're going to go over one of the great pros of this is that the digestion and hydrogel effectively clears the sample fairly well. So in A, we have a mouse brain in the right corner of that is after dissection. And the larger one that looks clear and is distorting the boxes is the brain after digestion and expansion. 
So we can look at the other panels to see how much clearer you can see individual neurons with this. Normally, if you have uncleared brain tissue, you have so much light scattering molecules that you would not be able to see this. So one of the major cons is very dim samples. So one of the issues is low signal. This is created by the process as well as all the fluorophores physically moving apart in all three directions. In this example, they go through a variety of fluorescent proteins and fluorescent dyes. And from there, do a comparison of live versus measuring that same fluorescent intensity. Some proteins like YFP do not do well after the expansion microscopy process. Some do much better like MRuby2 and the fluorescent dyes. Alexa 647 does very poorly, but it, Atto 647 does fairly well after expansion microscopy. One of the ways that you can increase this is using a label retention technique with trifunctional anchors. We'll have an anchor into the gel, a connector into proteins, and a reporter, which you can then read out. This vastly increases the retained fluorescence compared to other staining methods. Another way that you can improve signal is do post-expansion labeling. I particularly like to use nanobodies that are direct directly conjugated to a fluorophore. This makes it so that the linkage between the actual protein that you're studying and the fluorophore is minimized. You can see the difference between a nanobody and an antibody here. So this will greatly reduce that error. Another potential problem you may run into is measurement errors due to the size of your labeling or gel. So as you can see here, antibodies can change the structure. If you label before expansion, you're going to amplify this problem. And if you do the post-labeling, you're generally going to have a lot less problems with the measured diameter of your structure. Example of this is malaria using expansion microscopy that you do cross-linking it into the polymer. You're going to denature it do your first round of expansion to move those different proteins apart. You're going to do your image staining. This will cause gel shrinkage. And then you can go for a ra final round of expansion and imaging. And this gives you very good structure retention. Another problem you run into, these samples can only be imaged in pure water. So no PBS, no blinking solutions to be able to do this. So one of the ways to get around this is iterative expansion microscopy. Effectively, you effectively you do expansion microscopy and then re-embed it into the gel. You can do this multiple times if you're looking to increase your expansion factor into, say, the 25 times range. Or you can do this and add it to single molecule localization microscopy. And in this way, the researchers have been able to do DSTORM and be able to look at the structure of the centrosome in ninefold symmetry. Another problem that you'll run into is the expansion is all directions. So now your sample is four times thicker. One of the keys to this is to use a long working distance objective. At HCBI, we have a 40X 1.1 long working distance water on the LSM 880. 
and we have a 25x 0.A multi-immersion multi lens on the LSM 900 that both would work for this. Another thing that you need to make sure is if you're doing a monolayer cells, it's key to remember be able to track which side is up because you will not be able to image all the way through the gel. Another problem that you might run into is that your gel will move while you're imaging, and this will give you smeared images when you are doing a Z-stack. So there's a couple ways that you can get around this. I have had good luck with polylysine coating of the imaging dish. You, others have also used low melt agaros. It's important to remove excess water, and then you can confine it into a space in which there are edges to the imaging dish. So what are the differences between expansion microscopy and single molecule localization or super resolution microscopy? One of the pros is it's relatively straightforward sample prep. I've had several undergraduates and a master's student do this successfully. Fairly short acquisition times and easy multi-channel imaging I have done four channels, no problem. And it also reduces the background levels if you're doing tissues. Some of the cons are that it can take days to prepare this sample, depending on which method you're doing and which type of sample that you have. It can be difficult to handle. Once you have expanded it fully, it becomes more fragile and will easily break. As everything moves across and goes through the processing, you're going to have much lower signal, and this can be a problem for signal to noise, which gives you the quality of the image. Being able to validate that it expanded in all directions on the nanoscale can be fairly difficult, and there's a very finite lifespan to the samples that you really can only image it reliably for a few days after pre pre preparation.